Natasha Scott, welcome to my podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so pleased we made this this happen. We've been going back and forth for months now, I think. So long, and I've been feeling so bad about it because... You know when someone wants you to do something and you keep pulling out and you pull out with a legitimate reason but it sounds like you're talking bullshit to just pull out of it and I never wanted you to feel that way because as I said, Dom, I don't think you're a waste of time. <laughs> and so it just it just got to the point where I was like, look, I need to make this happen because I don't want him to think I'm avoiding him. Uh, and here I am in your podcast room and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. It's, well, it's wonderful to have you here. Um, Aisha Scott, for anyone that doesn't know, um, very, very famous, uh, maybe more so outside Everywhere of New Zealand. Everywhere but New Zealand. <laughs> yeah, for being on the uh, the Bravo reality show, Below Deck, which, hand on heart, I've never seen a full episode of. No worries. Um, but I'm well aware of who you are, and in preparation for this podcast, I've watched, I've gone on a deep dive on YouTube, and there's so many... <laughs> So many clips, and uh, you and I have got one thing in common. One, th we've, I'm sure we've got many things in common, but there's one thing I noticed that we've got in common. We would both rather watch Gilmore Girls than Sucker Dick. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, Dom. No, you wouldn't. Although no. I have got a real nice penis now, so it's like not as true. But <laughs> oh, your your fiance my has a real nice penis. My boyfriend, right. yeah. Right. But still, regardless of your sexual orientation, I can't think there'd be many people that would rather suck a dick than watch an episode of Gilmore Girls. It's such a good show. <laughs> and I've been to the set of the show, and it's just this paradise. So now, I stand by it. This, um, that sort of quote is, um, uh, I think, a, a good sort of sample of who, who we're dealing with here and who you yeah. are. It's like you, you, you just say... You say these things, and do you, do, you, do you know they're funny? Are you saying it to be funny or shocking, or do you just speak and then think afterwards? What happens? I think I was just raised, and I was raised in a household where it was very liberal and very sexually orientated. Do you know, I, I watched American Pie when I was like five. I asked my mum what sodomy was when I was seven, and I because I had four older brothers, and so it was just all this sex talk. And so I guess I've just grown up with these very vulgar kind of comments at top of mind. And it's actually been a really big hit over in the States with people that you wouldn't expect it to be, like the 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 mums that are in their 50s and 60s because they're like, oh my gosh, you you say everything that I'm thinking but I'm not confident enough to say it. And <laughs> no, but no, no. And say it. People say that but no one is thinking the stuff that you I say. Think, <laughs> I think people are a little bit more naughty in their minds than you're giving them credit for, especially these women that are, you know, stuck at home watching TV. And they're like, you just managed to say these things that we're thinking in such a like cutesy kind of way that you managed to get away with it. Mm. <laughs> we we, we will get so. into this later. I've got a laundry list of stuff that you've said. Like the, there's the Gilmore Girls <laughs> thing. Uh, you talking about playing vagina e guitar. Oh, yeah. uh, there's a story about you um, being um, abs ha ha almost having like a, a poo fetish when you were eight and putting a finger <laughs> up your bum. We'll get to all this hey, later. it wasn't a fetish, it was a curiosity. <laughs> but literally nobody is thinking this stuff, but here you are and you say it. Um, another thing, oh, congratulations, New Zealand Television Personality of the Year. Thank you. This was just at the end of 2023. Yep. So who who were you up against? Who were the finalists? Um, I was up against Di, who I listened to your podcast with him. It was amazing. Yeah, he's a great man. Um, Luke Bird, Kim Crossman, Susan DeVoy, I think. Oh, oh, yeah, she was on um, Celebrity Treasure Island. Yeah, there was a oh, Guy Montgomery. Right. But I f it felt so overwhelming winning that award because the thing that I, the one thing that I found a little bit, not disheartening, but a little bit irritating over my kind of like rise to fame and this is the success that I've had overseas. I was talking to Colin about this from Below Deck Sailing, who's also a Kiwi, and it took so long for New Zealand to kind of give a shit about what we were doing overseas. You know, like we were getting all of this attention over in the States and I couldn't even get like a Bay of Plenty Times newspaper article. And we were like, what is going on? Why does no one care about what we're doing? And it's only been in the last kind of year that Below Deck's become popular here and people have started writing articles and people know our names. And so when my name got called out at the New Zealand TV Awards, I thought I was going to do this really cool speech and be super funny, but I actually just broke down and I couldn't stop crying for like an hour 
Because it felt like mum and dad finally said they were proud of me. You know, it was like that feeling. <laughs> Validation in your like home country. New Zealand, that feeling that New Zealand like finally <laughs> has recognised what I've been doing for like six years. <laughs> and it was really cool. Yeah, because you're, you're obsessed with TV, eh? You've, you've oh, been obsessed with TV since nah. a, a youngster. I'm, no, to be honest, I don't watch TV. I love being on it. Yeah, I've always wanted to be on TV, but I've never really watched TV too much. Apart from Shortland Street. Oh, but I love Shortland Street. Oh, <laughs> yeah. my God. No, but it, I mean, Sorry, yes, Shortland Street was a staple in the household. Yeah, yes. Yeah. No, yeah, but I, I guess I mean um, it, it's almost like um, you sort of manifested this whole thing. Yes. Like yeah. from a young age, you thought you belonged on TV. And yeah. it was, you sort of aspired to do that. And then, then it, it, it happened, and it's... um. It's amazing. I don't know if it's serendipity or manifestation or whatever it is, but yeah. the steps you went through, and we'll go through all of this. Yeah. Um, it's amazing. So I can see why you were so emotional being on that stage last year. Yes. It was a cool moment. It was it was so, so cool. It actually, it's just one of those things that still feels so surreal. My whole life feels so surreal. When I actually sit and think about the position that I'm in and all the things that I've achieved over the last year, I don't know. It's really hard to actually process it, and I don't think it's all kind of hit mm. me yet. Yeah, but you're so you deserve it though. Eh? You're so positive. Aww. Do people say? Have you heard the phrase "toxic positivity"? Yeah. Do you, <laughs> yeah. Do people say that about you? Do you know? I actually don't get that very often. I've had it maybe once or twice <laughs> ever, but sometimes when I'm saying things, because none of it is put on. It truly is how I view the world. But every now and then, I'm like, oh. I wonder if people think that I'm putting this on to try, like, hoping that it will manifest all of these things. But that's just that's just who I am. Mm. Yeah, it's I funny mean, how people want to rip you apart for being too positive now, eh? <laughs> yeah, because I mean, uh, as I said, I've never, never seen a full episode of Below Deck, but I, I am one of your eight hundred thousand Instagram followers. Thank so I, ha- you. I have been for many years, <laughs> and I love watching your stories. It's oh, always it's always you. upbeat. Yeah. And if there's elements of, I don't know, fake it till you make it there or elements of you even wearing a mask and not showing us the you know, the, the dark side of yeah. Asia Scott, I think that's fine as well in a way. Yeah, well, I'm really lucky. I think I was blessed with a very good brain chemistry. And I, I think there are other reasons too which I've like, which my therapist has talked to me about, which I find very interesting, like about coping with my mum's alcoholism and different ways that that personality comes out as a child but that you know so different things from my upbringing plus just having great brain chemistry means that I'm lucky that I actually am this happy like 99% of the time (laughs) but I am only human so like the day before my period if Scott says like the tiniest thing wrong I will burst into tears and cry about nothing but it's always like (laughs) period related or like if I'm tired but I'm very rarely actually unhappy which which I know that I'm lucky for because everyone everyone else in my family has really struggled with depression and anxiety Mm. and different things from time to time so I know that I'm very lucky yeah, oh, there's there's so much to loop back around and get into. Yeah, um, so there's a there's there's a lot there's a lot to your story. Um, okay, we'll we'll focus on the early years first of all, though. So okay. you, you're from Tauranga, which is yeah. where you're back living now. Yeah. Um, alcoholic mum. Yeah. Yeah. So what what? Because I see your mum on Instagram all the time, and you, you went out for a, like the day before we we're recording this. You guys were out for a, a hike together. Yeah. Uh, she looks fit and healthy. She's not in, not drinking anymore. No, no. So what did what did that look like? What are your earliest memories of your mum? So. I think, so yeah, I feel like a lot of my life was, a lot of my childhood was very much, like the story that followed all of it was centred around mum and her drinking. And I think from a very young age, it was, you know, mum's got to go to rehab. Oh, what's mum going to be like when we get home? Or mum's drinking this and mum's drinking that. And can I just preface this by saying... even with her drinking, she has always been the most devoted, loving mum. Like, even mm. if she's wasted the night before, she will get up every morning at five and lay your school uniform out and make sure your breakfast is ready. And apart from her drinking, she will do everything she can to to be the best mum she could ever be. And I think that breaks my heart for her that she has had to struggle with this alcoholism because we were raised with... Uh, my dad, he's a psychiatric nurse by tra- by training, and he ran this psychiatric unit at Tokunui Hospital when he, in his early years. So we, we've always been raised with a very thorough understanding of mental health and the way the brain works. And we, 
have always known that alcoholism is a disease and a lot of it is genetic. Um, she's got people in her family that have died of alcoholism. Um, and so we knew it was a disease. And so if anything, we just felt so sorry for her that she was born with this thing that no one would ever choose to have. Um, and, you know, I just remember one of my earliest memories was coming home and finding mum when she had tried to kill herself because oh. she was just struggling so much oh. with... How old were you? Seven at the time. And I remember I came home and, you know, when you come home from... You've been with your dad at minor 10 or something and you come home and you're so excited to run inside and say hi to mum. And um, I was the first one to run inside to try and find her and I just remember she was it's so funny the way your brain works when you're little and I she was still in her nightgown at like 2 p.m and she was backing out of the laundry instead of walking out of a door and then closing it behind you she had the door in her hand and she was slowly backing out of the laundry and closing it as she was coming out and there was something about that movement and the look on her face I was like something's really not right here that's not how people act and I just like she turned and looked at me and I was like nah something's wrong so I sprinted back outside see I was like dad dad something's wrong with mom something's wrong with mom and he runs inside takes one look at her runs back out grabs all of us kids in his arms runs across the yard jumps the fence smashes on the neighbor's door like please take the kids take the kids runs back zooms off to the hospital um and it turns out she'd taken 40 panadol and a whole bunch of wine obviously um and he came back after the hospital she had to stay in there overnight and he came back afterwards and we all sat on the bed and we had a family meeting and he was like so basically your mum wanted to go to sleep and never wake up again. And we were like, okay, okay. And he's like, and I was like, so basically she wanted to die. And he's like, yes. Because we always, he always spoke to us like we were adults, you know. And so that was kind of like the stuff that was going on in my really early years. It's and chaotic. The, yeah. And so that's kind of, yeah. So most of my childhood was shaped with incidences like that and, um, yeah, just never really knowing what you're going to get when you came home. So how, how did she? How did she? Get, you said she was in and out of rehab. How did she end up um, kicking the habit once and for all? So she eventually, she finally. So all of this continued on through primary school and through high school, and she would have moments where she would um, be sober. Like she'd go to rehab and then she'd come out and she'd be sober for maybe a year, and it was always that like sick feeling that dreaded feeling yeah. like when are we going to come home and it's going to be she'll be back into it and the day she did we just like all felt like throwing up it was just the worst um throw, and throw, you felt like throwing up because you felt bad for her because it was just like it always was just so you felt so gutted when she went back mm. into it again but we always knew it would happen eventually Fucking but the day that we never wanted to face the day it did Imagine how shit she felt as well when she... Exactly, exactly. And so we were never angry at her. It was just like gutting, you know. You just felt gutted. Were you you embarrassed about taking friends home? Oh, yeah. I didn't tell any of my friends. I never had friends over. I was so embarrassed because you just never knew what you'd walk into after the school bus. Um, So I always went to other people's houses and I never really... I didn't tell any of my friends until I was like 18. Um, and then we left home. My sister had the worst time because she was left at home with mum when we all left home. Um, and so then, anyway, sorry, she finally kicked it when it just got to the point where it was so bad. We'd all left home, so no one was really keeping an eye on her. And my brother, Jared, he was always like, he always felt like he had to be the man of the house and protect her. And he was really struggling with depression himself at the time, working full time anemic so run down and then on top of that he was because mum was in such a bad way he had all of her cards he had her car key so after work he would go to the supermarket he'd buy her groceries he'd drop them to her house and he would like he was doing all these things to look after mum while he was barely able to look Mm, after himself and so it just got to the point where Jared was like I can't do this anymore so one day he said to mum he's like look I'm so sorry but if you can't if you can't finally get a handle on this, I have to let you go. I'm going to have to stop loving you because it's just too hard. Um, oh, my God. I know. And so that's what gave her the wake-up like wake call, I guess, or 
Not that you, uh, like not an that ultimatum know. almost in a way. Yeah, and so she checked herself into a rehab and she didn't leave for two years because most rehabs, they are like three-month programs. And I'm sorry, but if you're like a proper lifelong addict, that's fuck all. That's not going to do anything. Um, so she was like, I'm going to check myself in somewhere. There's this place um, in... It's like it's on the outskirts of Wellington, and it's the best one in the country. You can because you can stay for so long. Um, and she's like, "I'm not leaving until I know for sure that I've got a handle on this." So she didn't leave for two years, and now it's been ten years that she's been <laughs> sober, and I'm so proud of her. And I just, I truly take my hat off to her. She's the strongest woman I know. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, we're, we're and and I just really want to reiterate the fact that. She's very open with me talking about this stuff because she thinks it's important for other people to be educated on it all. But it, through all of that, she was the most loving mother. Yeah. Like a, like a functioning alcoholic. Is that what you'd call a functioning, functioning alcoholic? Yeah, I guess or? like a functioning... I mean, you could very much tell that she was drunk in the evenings. But she still took care of us and she still gave us so much love. Mm. Um was, you, yeah. was, was your dad still around then? When, when did they break up? Was it the alcohol that broke them up? Or? Yeah, there was a few different things. They were never really right for each other. They kind of just stayed together because she got pregnant with my brother really quickly. Um, so then, you know, they did the whole thing and then you, well, we may as well stay together and then we get married stay and together we for have the kids. more kids. <laughs> yeah, so they, they were together for 12 years. Um, but when I was around seven or eight they started sleeping in separate bedrooms and then when I was 10 they divorced and honestly when they divorced we were all like oh thank god because it was just it was so it was getting so tense around the house yeah and it was so it was kind of this thing that was it was such a long time coming that when it happened, it was almost like the sigh of relief. You know, you hear these stories of people being like, oh, my parents divorced and it's ruined my life. And ruined. and I'm so sure that that's true for a lot of people, but it just didn't really affect us. We were more like, finally. Yeah, I think my parents were sort of the same. Like they stayed together for the kids because they were yeah. four kids, but it's like... They're better off as individuals yeah. as a couple, and it would have been great if they just they they broke up a couple of times and got back together. Yeah, if they just stayed. But I, th I think a lot of it with my parents was financial. It's like they, yeah. they couldn't yeah, afford to true. run two households. Yeah, totally. Anyway, so and um, yeah. So, it's, so everything your family's been through, like it's a, your family seems really tight and together, mm. and, which is amazing because it could have easily gone the other way. Totally. And, and when did you lose a brother to a brain tumor? When was so. We lost Ruben to a brain tumour when he was 24. So I was, it was my first year of uni. Um, and that was actually, oh my God, do you know? Oh my God, this ties in to this two degrees of separation thing. So my brother, so yeah, so he got diagnosed when I was uh, just turned 18. I was at uni down in Wellington. Um, and I remember being with him at the hospital um, in Wellington and I remember standing there when he was getting his test results because he was at a wedding and he couldn't hold a knife properly and he was like, oh, Dad, like, I can't hold this knife properly. I don't know what's going on with my hand. And he was a uh, carpenter in the army. And Dad was like, you know, you've probably just, um, <clears throat> you've probably just got, what do you call it, like when you've... Like RSI or yeah, severed a tendon? Yeah, or, he thought he just like strained his tendons right, or something. Yeah. But he went to the doctors and no one can get to the bottom of it. So they finally were like, well, let's just do a scan just to be safe. And I remember standing in the Wellington in Wellington Hospital and it shows up on the screen and there's these two big golf ball-sized tumours in his brain. Mm -hmm. And just that moment where it hits you and you realise, like, how bad it is. And I, and, like, I remember he just, like, looked at Dad and was just like, Dad, I'm fucked. Like, I'm absolutely fucked. And it was in a position in his brain where it was so deep that they were like, we just, we can't operate because you're just going to become a complete cabbage, basically, if we mm. operate. And um, I remember... I remember uh, when I was at, oh, so then he was, uh, he grew up in Palm, Palmerston North primarily. And so when I was at uni one day, I remember I was sitting in a lecture and dad's like, it's happening, like we need to go right now. He was at a hospice and he, he flies from Tauranga to Wellington, gets a hire car, picks me up. He called my lecturers, explained what was going on, and we rushed to the hospice in Palmerston North and they said, you know, he's got a couple of days left. 
And then we were sitting there and he was like, he said his dying wish was to um, marry his beautiful girlfriend, Laura. And it was just so heartbreaking because I think about where I am in my life now. Like I'm, I've got this beautiful partner, like Scott's you're probably going to propose soon at some point in the next Just year. Just as you manifest You know, <laughs> sometime in the next year. <laughs> you know, sometime in the next year, we're just about to buy a house. And that's the position he was in. He'd just gotten, en- oh, no, he wasn't engaged, but he was going to propose. Mm. He'd just bought a house. Like this really exciting time. So he said his dying wish was to marry Laura. Oh. And so we're like, cool, let's all jump into gear. So we organised for a wedding to be held the next day in the hospice. Um, So we got (coughs) all the paperwork signed. We got everything organised, but it was freezing and it was middle of winter. Um, And this is where I was like, oh my gosh, this kind of ties into you a little way. Laura used to listen to the radio and JJ had this like cape Oh, that that's she, the ex we're married in Queenstown. Yeah, she had this cape. Right, right. So yeah, she, fair. I don't know who reached out to her or whatever, but she ended up currying down her wedding cape and Laura wore that for the wedding because it was freezing in Palmerston. So she wore that um, on the wedding uh, the next day and the most beautiful thing happened. So we were like... We got him to sign the night before and we're like, hopefully he's good enough that we can like wheel him down the aisle. And like, it sounds morbid. We were like, hopefully we can get them married like right before he dies so that like, we just need to get it done. Mm. But he wakes up the next morning and obviously this is where I say like the power of love is amazing. Mm. He wakes up the next morning and none of the nurses could believe their eyes. He was so much better. He got himself out of bed. He got into a suit. He walked himself down the aisle um, and did his vows and everything, got married to her. And he ended up living another six months. And just the night before, they were like, he will die tomorrow. So that's the beautiful power of love. So he ended up lasting another six months, and we shifted him down to... Um, Allthorpe, which is the hospital that my dad was the CEO of at the time. So dad kind of moved his office into his room. And and then, yeah, and then when Reuben died, I was the one that found him. Well, not found him, but I was the one that was alerted everyone because he was in the room and dad had explained to us, he's like, there's this type of breathing that happens right before someone dies. And if you ever hear them doing this I breathing... I love the death rattle. Yeah, it's, it's like the... Mm. you know that shallow kind of breathing right. and he's like if anyone sees that you need to run around and let everyone know and the cleaner came in and said she had to clean and we all had to leave the room so everyone dispersed so far around the hospital I don't know what people were thinking but everyone dispersed and took that time to go for walks and things and I was kind of just loitering outside the door and then the cleaner ran up to me and she's like please come come look and I went inside and he was doing that breathing and I was just like shit 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 so I sprinted around the hospital and I'm like get to Ruben's room get to Ruben's room and got everyone and so all of our family got into the room and um we all were sitting with our hands on Reuben and it was really beautiful because the last words that he said was um he said he as between each breath he was like I love you all and then it was like a few minutes later he passed away so <laughs> oh my god so his communicative right to the end yeah yeah but he, he hadn't really been and so it just showed as i say again sorry the power of love um oh thank you uh the power of love he just really he like hadn't really been speaking at all mm. and so he obviously you know again he just really wanted to get that out mm. so yeah so then he passed away and we all had our hands on him, which was amazing. But you're 24, like how cruel is oh, that? Oh, you're a kid, aren't you? Oh, such a kid. Jeez, that's um. Sorry. <laughs> oh no, shit! You, you've been through a lot, eh? Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. oh. there, there's, you know, people say that time heals wounds, but I, I don't know. I think with grief that big. It doesn't actually get any easier, but you just find a way to deal with it and, totally. and, and coexist with it. Exactly. It's a terrible thing. Yeah, and I think it's it's as sad as it is. Um, for me, I kind of just spend a lot of time, I'm just like, just not thinking about it. And um, it's just moments where if I'm... If I have a quiet moment, like we're living with my partner's parents at the moment and they've got a field next door with a cow in it. And I love going to sit with this cow. And sometimes (laughs) we call call her Puriri. 
because she loves the pūrere tree. And often I'll just go and sit in the field with the cow and she's eating grass and I'm looking out at the water. And it's those little moments where I think, I can't believe Reuben was eight years, eight, uh, eight years younger than what I am now when he passed away and all the things he didn't get to experience. And I still feel like life's just beginning and there's, there's so many exciting things. And how... I just can't imagine what that feeling would be to be told you've got this thing and you're not going to, and there's nothing you can do about it. It Mm. wouldn't, isn't that, wouldn't that just be the hardest news in the whole world to receive? Yeah, it's cruel. Yeah. It's cruel. It's really unfair. Yeah. So, um, so your mum was still drinking at that point, or had she... No, so my three oldest brothers are, um, my three oldest brothers are dad's kids not mums they're my they're half brothers oh, okay. but we all grew up we all grew up together yeah. so we fully consider them our full mm. siblings um but at that so it wasn't mum's son um but at the time at that time mum was in the rehab in wellington oh, the so there was a lot one. going okay. on yeah. yeah fuck there is a lot going on yeah and, and you, you mentioned um uh, earlier that you've you've had some therapy was the, the therapy start around this time or no. earlier or later you, no. uh, you had a lot of uh, a lot of stuff to process yeah yeah <laughs> um no actually i'm I, I haven't I didn't actually start doing therapy until like six months ago. Um, I this is why I say you know the way that we grew up. I'm so grateful for it. I actually wouldn't have wanted it any other way, because it made me such a strong, resilient woman, and I I feel like I've got such a. This sounds so wanky now, but I feel like I've got a much better understanding of so much of the world and the way people work mm. compared to people that had these really easy, protected kind yeah. of childhoods. So, uh, uh, by the way, for, for what it's worth, I don't think that sounds wanky at all. Yeah, and I feel like that's um that's a Kiwi thing that you need to preface it by saying it's wanky because yeah. you know people are going to think, oh, you know, she thinks so. so yeah, take your hand off it. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> so. Um, so I, yeah, so I'm very grateful for the way I was raised. And so because of that, like, as all these things happen and, and the fact that we grew up in a household where it was basically constant therapy, like we talked to each other about our feelings all the time. So I've never really needed it, but it's just in the last six months, um, because I've heard so many friends just rave about it, I was like, you know what, I'm going to give it a go. And so I started with this lady, Sam, who is incredible. We do it by Zoom. I'm in my pyjamas. And it was more of a way to, like, <laughs> and rather than working through something, because it's I don't really have things to properly work through. It's just learning about myself and my brain and the way it works. And it's been a fascinating journey. I really recommend everyone do it, whether you've got an, a big issue or not. It's just, I think it's so important to know how your own brain works. Mm, and also it's just a different perspective and a different way of looking at certain situations. Yeah, exactly. It's really cool. But your, yeah, your family, it's um, it's total goals. So, there, so, yeah, you were, so you were diagnosed with ADHD yes. at eight. Yeah, and, and your dad, um, I think I read this somewhere or heard it on another podcast, had like a like a, a family meeting <laughs> yeah. without you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so my dad had a fact because I was like, I I've had meetings with psychologists since, and they're like, wow, we've never met a more ADHD person in our life. Um, so I grew up very yeah, very hyperactive, very like mood swings, just very attention seeking all of that stuff all of the good stuff um and I remember when I was like yeah it was when I was eight me and my my brother and I were having this fight and he was like yeah well dad told me that you were ADHD and I was like (laughs) what I just broke down I was like what do you mean and he ended up telling me that dad had held this family meeting to tell it to tell all the other siblings so he's like you know just go easy on her like Get, don't don't get too worked up or like you know let we've all just got to understand that Aisha's got ADHD and this is why she behaves like the way she behaves and so yeah so it turns out and then I went to dad and I was like what do, what do you mean you had this family meeting and so we took me on a walk and we went on this big walk all around the suburb we we're in Mangatapu at the time and I and yeah and he just walked along with me and as a as a psychiatric nurse does he explained to me exactly what ADHD is and 
why it happens and what the symptoms are, right? And I just remember walking along going, but it's not my fault, hey? And he's like, no, of course it's not my fault. And, you know, at first I thought, at first, I thought it was like a something not to be embarrassed about, but something that I would like. I got defensive about it at first because it's like no child wants to be different. Of course. But then, as I got older, now I'm like, fuck yes. And all my siblings, they're like, why did you get to be born with that? They're so jealous of it because I just have. Free energy, basically. Just endless free energy. And it wasn't until I got to uni that I actually properly got diagnosed because I was in my first trimester of uni and we would we would get given these assignments and I knew that I was, like, a smart girl and we were getting these assignments and everyone else was managing to do the readings and finish them within, like, an afternoon. But it would take me so much long like days longer Mm. and I couldn't understand why because I knew I was just as smart as everyone in the room and so I finally and I because it's just you know that whole thing of having to read a sentence 50 times before you actually like take in what it's saying and all of that so I finally went to a psychiatrist and yeah and they diagnosed me and I got prescribed Ritalin and it it annoys me that people were quite anti- medication and Ritalin and stuff but that it that is what got me through uni if I didn't have that uni would have been so much more difficult for me Mm. yeah because JJ and I we had a a family adoption and the kid that we were looking after her uh, nephew Savin um he got diagnosed and was was ADHD yeah and then the the pediatrician said oh we'll we'll get him on some Ritalin or computer and we'll see how it goes and we were like oh yeah, your medication because you just have this sort of stigma about it. Yeah, and um, the pediatrician she's like, "Well, we'll put him on it. If it doesn't work, we'll take him off." Yeah, and I thought, "Oh yeah, that's yeah, that is so sensible." Yeah, and it was an absolute game changer. Yeah, like Monday to Friday, we'd be at work and his nanny would sort out his medication. But on the weekends, on a Saturday or Sunday, if it got to like ten a.m. and he was acting up, I could say straight away. Have you had your you had your your, yeah. your, your writ this morning? Yeah, exactly. And, uh, it was. Did you find that with the medication? It was like that much of a game changer for you. Oh, absolutely. Um, because I think the thing that people have to remember as well is that, especially like the, you can get long acting, but even that's like eight hours. But it's it's got no half life. Like it's 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 in your system for four hours and then it's out of your system. It's not something that builds up over time mm. and like it's not like an SSRI or a sustained release thing. It's it's literally like you take it that day and then after that day it's not in you anymore. So you can get real I get really savvy with like picking and choosing when I take it because for me I don't I don't like to take it day to day because I find because it does finally make me focused and a bit more chill. I don't feel like I'm as good socially so I don't so I would never take it if I was coming to do a podcast or if I was doing if I was filming or doing like a QA and a on stage or something but when I was at uni and I'm having to sit in the library for like eight hours to finish a report there's no way I could have gotten that done if I didn't have my medication and mm. it, it really just changed my life and um yeah and I just don't know why people were so Anti, I mean, we've yeah. made this modern medicine to help us, and it helped, and it really, really helped me. Yeah, it's the, the same thing with mental health. There's a lot of people that um, take it as a badge of honour that they don't oh, need no. medication, but if, if if it's a chemical imbalance in your brain that needs Ooh. to be rectified and can be rectified, yeah. just fucking do it. I think that, and I think that's a really dangerous attitude mm. to have. You know, people who are getting so high and mighty, are like, well, I just did it through running, <laughs> and it's like, fuck yeah, that totally helps, absolutely. But if you're in a place where you your balance is that out, you need you need something to help you get to the place where running can sustain you. You're not, you're often not going to get there just from being healthy because you need to get mm. the balance back and then sustain that. Yeah. And it's like, why Why is that such a... I don't know why that's so frowned upon. Yeah, yeah it's weird. We, we do need to normalise that a little bit more, right? Yeah, totally. And, and also not making people feel like shit that are using the pills to Yeah, do 100%. It. Like, it doesn't make you any cooler for getting there just through ice baths. Mm. Like, we've all, got, <laughs> we've all got different journeys, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. You, you are smart, eh? So, um, <laughs> and I, do, do you feel like people sort of... Um, 
um, misjudge. I don't know because maybe because it's a it's a very thick Kiwi accent you've got. Very, very thick. thick. <laughs> um, the Kiwi accent and the, the things you say yeah. sometimes that people maybe underestimate how intelligent you are. I think that I do think that that is something. I think people do assume that I'm a little bit like airy fairy. And I, I think a lot of that is also because I am so happy. It's like, it's often that um, that classic hand-in-hand -hand personality, that p personality profile, right? Like, happy, eerie, eerie fairy, la, 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 I love everything. Um, but I just don't really mind because I'm like, well... I think it's cool. Yeah. If, I'm if, like, you're, if you're smart and you can fly under the radar and people... Yeah. Yeah, misjudge your intelligence. I think yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, and yeah, and as I say, I'm I'm really sure that they do, but I just don't really give a shit. And mm. I'm like, you might find out eventually, you might not, but it doesn't affect me. Mm. Oh, that's know. such a great attitude. Yeah. So, yeah. so after school, you go to Victoria University and you get a double science degree. What What were you thinking? Like, you had this, <laughs> you had this, this deep burning desire to end up on TV somehow. Yeah. Why did you end up doing a science degree? Because it's kind of twofold. Because. Well, A, I, I didn't really know, I always knew I wanted to go to uni because I just thought it would be such a great experience. And I didn't really know what I wanted to be, but I loved being outside. I just love the outdoors and I'm such a science freak. Like in my spare time, I'll, I like love to just sit and read about like chemistry and atoms and how all these things work. And it just fascinates me knowing how things work. Like ever since I was little, I'd always run up to dad and be like, how does how does that engine work? How does that how do you do the tire? How do you do this? How do you do this? Um, and so I thought, well, why not go to uni and spend my time learning how the earth works? Like that sounds so interesting, and I get to go on camps and do all these cool things. And I knew, so I knew that I would end up on TV somehow. I didn't know how, but I knew that it would come to me. And so I didn't really go off chasing it. Which again, that probably sounds so wanky, but I, I, I knew so much in my gut that it would happen for me that I was like, just live your life and do your thing, and eventually it will pop mm. up, and it did. Yeah, and by the way, it doesn't sound wanky, and it's a fascinating journey how you got into the the boat sector. Yeah, it, way before um, Below Deck was was even yeah. a show, so it wasn't yeah. like a. Um, set pathway that you took no. for reality TV. No. So you get this double science degree, then you work in a kiwi fruit lab. Yes. Now, you did do your research. Uh, yeah. No. Well, it, just the, the the juxtaposition between yeah the the, the Asia that people like, I suppose think they know and who you actually are. Like it's it's fascinating. It's almost like um you're a chameleon in a way. Like yeah. Because I can't yeah. imagine you you work in a kiwi fruit lab <laughs> in, a, in a white coat. Like talking about putting a, putting a finger up your bum to feel the poo, you, or, or watching the Gilmore. You know, you know what I mean. It's a different sort of environment. And it's Did so you? funny because when I was in the kiwi fruit lab, I was that. You know, we we're all sitting there doing our testing, and I was that girl that all day was like, "Okay, for the rest of your life, if you could only have an orange or a mandarin, what would you choose?" And the whole day was just me fucking talking about that kind of shit. Oh, so you were, you were always like a square peg in a round hole then? Yeah. Like, okay, yeah. all right. <laughs> exactly. I sort of had this vision of you like just biting your tongue or just like trying to <laughs> manage yourself and then at the end of the day leaving the kiwi fruit lab and just letting it all blurt out then. Nah, I just tried to be everyone's entertainment because it was just such a stiff environment. I just was trying to like loosen it up a little bit. Uh, but I love, I mean, and that, it was, it was kind of boring. That's why I was talking about oranges and mandarins. But it was, you know, it was fun in a way. Um, but yeah, I think, because as you, you know, as you mentioned about since I was five knowing this thing, it's like, I just, I remember all through school, I was like, yep, it's going to happen one day. And then when I was at uni, I've got such a vivid memory of sitting on my bed and I'm like, when is this going to happen? I was genuinely, like, confounded because I was like, when is this going to happen for me? <laughs> I know that it's going to happen. I'm just I'm so confused because I thought it probably would have happened by now, but it hasn't. Hmm. And I'm just, like, sitting there, like, wondering when this is all going to happen. I was like, anyway, okay, I guess I'll carry on with uni for now. Um, carried on with uni, did, and then finished uni, moved back to Tauranga, and I was I wanted to work for, like, a geotech company or doing, like, Hydraulic, like, you know, water testing or something. Um, and then that didn't happen because no one in Tauranga leaves their jobs ever. So there's <laughs> never a job opening. <laughs> Still happens like that. Um, so no, no job opening. So I was managing a store there. 
Thanks, this like cool clothing store that we used to have there. And then um, when I was working at the store one day, my sister called me and she was like, oh, I've heard about this yachting thing. Cause she, she was working in a pharmacy and she wasn't super into it either. And she's like, I've heard about this yachting thing. I was like, oh yeah, tell me about it. And I, by the end of the phone call, I was like, mean, I'm in, let's do it. Hung up, handed in our two weeks notice. Two weeks later, we did the um, course that you have to do at the Polytech. And then two weeks after that, we flew to France. Yeah, well, what's, it, what's, it, the, what's the two-week course? Is it like a first aid course? Or? It's an SCCW course. So you have to do like fire fighting. So you've got to go through a bloody uh, container that's on fire in full fire gear in the dark, crawl through an obstacle course, and save a baby at the end of it, a fake baby at the end of it. <laughs> they still um, do real babies yeah, after the Yeah, they don't do real babies mail. anymore. <laughs> um, <yeah>. <laughs> Sips wasn't too happy about yeah. it. The so, parents come at the end of the day, where's, where's, where's Gavin? <laughs> Sorry, Gavin. I actually didn't do good enough, so Gavin's not here anymore. Um, so we save this potato sack baby, pull it back through. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, so you do firefighting, water survival, um, first aid, pub, social responsibility, security, all these different things that you'd need on a boat. Actually, it was only a week. Yeah, a week. And then after that, we flew to France. I'm a very impulsive person, in case you didn't pick up on that. Um, flew to France. We, got, we stayed in, like, a crew house. Uh, and then just started walking the docks. And then, yeah, and still was like, I know this will happen one day, but I'm just carrying on with my life, as I thought I'd do. And it wasn't until I'd been doing yachting for six years that a friend of mine who remembered, a friend of mine from school who knew I, about my TV dreams, she was like, oh, I've heard about this show Below Deck, and I've managed to get the casting agent's email I think you should go for it. You'll be really awesome. And I had never even heard of Below Deck before. I didn't know what it was. And I emailed them. They said, fill in a form. I said, a form's boring. I'll do a video. <laughs> um, so I sent in a video. And within 30 minutes, they were like, we need to have a Skype. When are you free for a Skype? And it went from there. And and it was so cool because when I got it and I was walked onto the boat and the cameras were rolling, this massive like wave of energy ran over my body and I and I was like, Whoa, this is the moment. I was like, this is what I knew I was waiting for my whole life. Like this is it. It's incredible how it worked out. So you yeah. you so the, the boat thing, you went on the boats to try and get on below deck. It's like yeah. You were just like following your, your instinct or your gut or whatever yeah. you want to call it. And yeah. It all worked out. Yeah, serendipity. Yeah, so, it was so those, amazing. So those years on the on the boats pre-below deck, what were they like? So you were like a deck hand? Yes, at first. Okay. What, yeah. what's, what's a deck hand? So a deck hand is you're, you're doing everything on the outside of the boat. So you're polishing, washing, um, yeah, outside of shit. <laughs> and then, it's, but well, basically, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cleaner. Yeah, well, we're all basically cleaners, right, whether okay. you're inside or outside. Um, cleaners and waitresses, basically. Yeah. So I was a deckhand, and I was outside, and but I had this, like, cunty as sorry, misogynistic <laughs> no, captain who I just could not stand. And he would do things like he'd wait until I'd completely washed the boat he he seemed he hated woman but then hired me so I don't know why he did that um and I basically did everything by myself because the other deckham was an alcoholic that would just go sleep in the bilge all day and he'd like wait until I finished washing all of the boat and then he'd start like sawing wood on the aft deck so, <laughs> so all of the sawdust is going all over the boat <laughs> and like the other deckham would be like oh Aisha's just washed it don't you want to do that on the port and he's just he would just look at me in the eye and be like I know someone who'll wash it again. And then what really did it was this one time. So we would two-part take. So that means, like, you would do an acid wash and then you'd do another wash on top of that and it kind of, like, stripped the teeth back and made it look really nice. And the acid that you use looks like water. And we didn't have any acid one day. We'd run out. So I went to the boat next door. I asked to borrow some acid. They gave me some in a drink bottle. And I was doing the teak, put the, put it down, and I was, like, scrubbing. And I didn't know that the stewardess had come around thinking she was being helpful, tidying up for the end of day, grabbed the bottle and had put it down in the galley. And so I'm, like, scrubbing away. It's, like, 40 degrees. It's so hot. We finish up. I go inside. I'm like, oh, I'm so thirsty. 
go down to the galley and I see this water bottle, clear liquid, pick it up, go to like, and I go take this big drink from it and it gets halfway down my throat and my brain is like, clicks, it's like something's wrong. And I'm like, and just spit it everywhere because it's fucking acid in my mouth. Spit it everywhere. And so, the, and I'm like, oh my God, I'm like, acid, acid, uh. and so I'm running to the sink, and I'm like, uh, tap on, water running into my mouth, just trying to like rinse this acid out, and the captain like, hears the commotion, runs down the stairs, he's like, what's going on, what's going on, and I tell him about it, and he just looks over the galley, and sees that there's like little white specks all over like the countertop Ooh. and stuff, because I'd spit acid, yeah, yeah. you know, because I spit the acid out, and he did not once ask me if I was okay, how I was, <laughs> anything, just looked with this disgusted look over the galley, because there was like white specks in there, and then he walks up, and, he's, and he said, well, did you swallow it, and I was like, no, I... I realised as it was going down and I spit and I like managed to spit it all back out. Um, but I still had like some blisters on the inside mm. of my mouth. And he goes and walks off and he's halfway up the stairs and he just like looks at the guys and he's like, well, I guess we know she doesn't swallow. And that's all he said. He never, never asked me if I was okay. And after that, I was just like, I was so done with it. And I... Why didn't you tell him, like, so I... From bits and pieces I've seen of you online, I feel like you're the sort of person. Maybe this is you now versus back then. Yeah. But now you'd you've got the strength of character to tell him to go fuck himself. Yes, and which not I tolerate it. So at the time, I didn't in that moment because yeah, this is my very first yachting job, and I was like in this position where I it was my first time kind of having this power play with with my superior who fucked with my head, and it, you know I was so mm. young at the time and didn't quite know how to deal with it, but then. It was like after that, I was like, I'm done. And I was packing my bags and I was like, right, I'm going to like find a good moment to leave. And he he said, he made some other comment like a couple of days later. And I was just like, I fucking quit. I was like, I'm done. Mm. I'm leaving this boat. And, um, oh, because he took, yeah, we were off the boat and we were walking back on. He made a comment and I was like, I'm done. I'm leaving. I'm done with this shit. And I just looked at him and, and he was like, oh, well, have a nice life, Asia. And I just turned and looked him dead in the eye and I was like, you must have the smallest fucking cock to treat women the way you treat them. And I was like, you are disgusting. And I just like turned around and walked on the boat and he's like, have a nice life, Asia. Like this 60 year old French man who's like, have a nice life, Asia. Like the most pathetic thing ever. And then he, held my passport and wouldn't give me my passport and so I'm like pack my bag storm off the boat he refuses to give me his passport give me my passport so I had to go to one of the yacht agencies and like I burst in there bawling my eyes out. I'm like man my captain and I told him he's got a small dick and he's got my passport <laughs> and, blah, blah. And, you know, <laughs> and they met they ended up calling him and said they're gonna get the police to come to the boat if, they, if he doesn't hand it over so then I had to walk back there by myself and like face him again and have him give me my passport was he contrite at that point Oh, he just, yeah, he just wasn't really speaking to me. He was yeah, just being yeah. a little shit. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so that kind of put a bad taste in my mouth of being a deckhand. And I actually moved home for like six months because I was like, fuck you, why does anyone want to do this? It's shit, I hate it. But then my sister stayed on and she was having a really good time on bigger boats because that was a 35 metre and she was on much bigger ones, which are way more fun. So then after six months, I was like, you know what, I'm going to give this another go. So I went back as a stewardess on bigger boats and I loved it. Why, it why are the bigger so boats more fun? fun? Is it because there's more of a crew? Or? Yeah, it's just there's more people and all of the, because on the smaller boats you kind of have to do everything because there's like one of you for inside and one of you for outside whereas on the bigger boats like, so the biggest one that I worked on was a 95 metre called Phoenix 2. It was like the most prestigious in the industry. It was so amazing if you got managed to get a job on there. And it was so big that it's, you are able to specialise. So I was only service. So we had four girls that were only service. So I never had to clean. I never had to do laundry. I was just doing like cocktails and dinners and things like that. And then like the cabins are nicer, way more people to hang out with. You've got a chef that's just for the crew. So you've got these mean as buffets, like every lunch and dinner, way nicer uniform everything's just bigger and better 
Who, who owns the boats? Are they celebrities or are they just rich, <clears throat> super rich people we never would have heard of? Or Yeah, usually the people that own the biggest boats, like celebrities can't really afford to own boats that big. It's like... So the Russians like, that have made heaps of money. Yeah, it's like... So that boat was owned by the richest family in Poland. It's like silly money. I remember we used to... Even just little things like... I had one. I asked for a pay rise because I was doing the job above me without the official title, and I was asked. For, I think I asked for like three hundred more euros a month or something like that, and I got it denied. And then they're coming on, for, and I'm not sure if that's like the owner's fault or just the person's fault not wanting to spend any more money. But then they come on for a trip, and they're like doing shot. They would do shots out of these two thousand euro each shot glasses, like baccarat crystal. <laughs> shot glasses and they do a shot and then they're like woo and they throw it up and they just throw it overboard and I've got like 10,000 euros just floating to the bottom of the ocean and I can't get like 300 more euros a month and I'm just like cool guys okay yeah, something's not right here yeah so like the kind of money they have is absolutely absurd absurd, absurd. And, and you um you must see some things or is is a yeah so, yeah, so say Someone's cleaning one of the rooms and there's like a plate with a, a pile of cocaine there. Oh, yeah, all the time. You just ignore it? Yeah, yeah, all the time. You always see like, and like sheets with just like shit all through the sheets or like shit in the shower. Or like, like shit as in, as in, as in feces? Yes, as in literal, yes. Um, I don't know. Having a bit of cheeky anal, but they don't bother to like. They just leave it. You know, like most people would like actually wrap the like not let the next person deal You'd be with embarrassed. that. Embarrassed, you don't yeah, want to see it. Yeah, but they just like, or like they wouldn't flush the toilet because they're like above flushing the toilet. And like my friend worked, on, <laughs> my friend worked on this Russian boat, and the father and the son had this fetish for girls on their period. So what they'd do is they'd fly in four prostitutes all on a different week of their cycle. So each week they had a girl that they both slept with that was on the rag. <laughs> this is outrageous. Yeah. This is outrageous. And when, when, when things like this happens, for you guys, the crew, yeah. everyone gossips about it and talks about it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We love, we love talking about it. But it's like you're, you're, not allowed to go in, you're not allowed to go and say names or anything like that. Yeah. But, um, oh, it's so funny. It's so funny. I've Great seen some stories. things. Yeah. And then, so then from there, from there, that's when, that's when Below Deck sort of came along. So you're doing these boats for five years? Yeah, it was like five or six years by the time I did, five years, I think, when mm. I did Below, started Below Deck, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's that, this is, yeah, it's amazing. You touched upon this a, a second ago and the, you, you gave the uh, video audition and um, Below Deck started. Um so what are your biggest surprises about that? First of all, like the smoke and smoke and mirrors of reality TV. Because a lot um, of reality TV is quite contrived, isn't it? It's like they have a... Yeah. Look at Married First Sight, they have like a template and... Yeah. So I think a couple of things surprised me. The first one was how big the show is. Because I didn't really know about Below Deck, as I said. And it wasn't until I'd done a season and I started walking around in the States and people were like, oh my God! and I was like what and then I realized that it's like one of Bravo's it's like one of America's biggest networks biggest shows and I just had no idea the scale of it when I went into it and I was like oh my god like how have I just managed to fall into this position where I'm on such a big show like how does this Happen. It was just the buzziest realization. Oh, it, it's, it's a juggernaut. So yeah, Bravo's yeah. got um, Real Housewives. That's probably their biggest franchise, right? Yeah, but and then below below deck. deck's actually bigger than them now. Unreal. People love it. Unreal. What was it and about your What was it about your audition? How How many minutes was it? The video. Two minutes. Right. I don't even remember what I said. I waited until I was at like peak hyperactivity. <laughs> and I'm two just days like, off. Hi, two days off the Ritalin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Exactly. I'm just like, hi, I'm Aisha. But I don't. I really don't even remember what I said. But they obviously liked it. Um, so that surprised me how the scale of the show. And then the other thing was just how impressive reality TV is. It gave me a whole. It gave me this whole appreciation for shows and how much work goes into making them because. 
what I will say about Below Deck is it is the most real reality show you'll ever see. It's, they do not, the, the fourth wall is massive, mm. so they do not tell you to do anything. It's purely like a follow documentary. And I was actually talking to a camera guy from it the other day, and he's like, yeah, after doing other shows, I can't believe how real Below Deck is. Um, but it was, I remember my first season, and they said never change up your movements to help out a camera guy because we've got three cameramen, sorry, camera people, there, there was a woman, um, three camera people and three audio people that trail them everywhere, plus cameras in every room, um, like fixed cameras. Um, <clears throat> and so I was like, okay, I can't change my movements for them. You've got to completely ignore them. And so we're running around the boat trying to get, you know, cause you're trying to get cocktails and things out to guests as quickly as possible. So sometimes you're actually running and they're in front of you going backwards as fast as you're going forwards with this massive camera on them and they like memorize the layout the blueprint of the boat so then they're stopping within like an inch of going off the edge of like the stairs on the aft of the boat and I just used to watch them like you guys are ninjas it's so <laughs> impressive their craft yeah, yeah it's and remarkable then and then, so, yeah so, so the um so there's there's the, the below deck crew which you're one yeah. of and then, so who owns the boats? Did, so, did Bravo like rent the boats? Yes. And then get you guys on board. Yeah. And then the 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 guests that are on board are they? That's almost like props on the show as well. Are they yeah. given like a free trip or is it a no, discounted trip? Or it's still. I mean, I don't. They don't like us to ever talk money and how much it is, but it's still like right. You and I would not go and do it. Yeah. Like I mean, you might, but it's it's it's. It's a lot of money still to come on um, for a two-night trip. Um, so, so yeah, so you've got the cast and then you've got production um, who we aren't allowed to acknowledge. I do now because I've been doing it for so long. Um, and then, yeah, the they charter – they – rent a boat for this we filmed for six and a half weeks and they rent the boat for that time and the crew that usually works on that boat they send off on holiday or pay for them to fly home or just like not be there and then the the guests that they have come on they they audition them too so they've all got to go through an audition process to make sure they're actually mm. going to be interesting on tv right because you, you've done so many seasons now wait, how many seasons have you four five. Uh, five five seasons now yeah right so when we so when you were getting prepared to go away for another season of filming mm -hmm. what sort of mindset are you in are you like okay you got to bring your a game oh yeah or, absolutely yeah yep yeah, so i i take it so seriously because I see, well, A, because I'm just, I'm, I think Kiwis have a good work ethic anyway, and then I come from a family of very hard workers, so I'm very anal about working hard. Um, and also, it's just out of respect for the production team, because when I see how many hours and hours and hours they put into watching it and editing it and, like, crafting these, sto like, you know, locking down these storylines that we see... It's so incredible how much of their life they devote to it the whole year that I'm like the least that I can do is come and do my very best job too. Mm. You know, just out of respect for the whole production. Yeah, hundred percent. And it, and it's been very successful for you. And I I, yeah. I I get from what I've read and heard, Bravo love you. Yeah, like you're one of their one of their golden girls. But yeah, but what what does that mean to do the best you can? Is it just be your truest, authentic? Yeah. funniest self or yeah it's just i because i think the thing is people don't realize how grueling filming is it's probably the hardest thing i've ever done in my life it's we're doing six and a half weeks of 16 hour days every single day and i don't really take breaks because i would rather give my girls breaks and make sure that they got a little break um, before I give one to myself. And usually we're too busy and I'll just carry on. And so we're doing these 16-hour days and then every fourth day we're having to go out and well, we don't have to get drunk, but we go out and we tend to get drunk. And so then we're even more sleep-deprived. And then the day after that we've got to clean the whole boat and do our confessional interviews. And it's just so mm. grueling and so intense and it's really easy for people like halfway through to let their energy slip and they're not like they're not working quite as hard or they're not giving quite as much energy because they're exhausted and for me <clears throat> giving it everything I have means 
right up until we wrap, giving it every single ounce of energy I possibly can. And I'm always real, I'm always genuine. I never put on like a character. But yeah, for me, it's just like doing my job, my job as a chief stew as best I can, like so, so hard. And then doing my job as, you know, bringing my personality and my energy every day, making sure I keep that up right to the end. Because I mean, it's so easy to just let it slip. Because you so, you just want to go to bed and sleep, but you can't. Yeah, and I suppose if you if you're boring or you're not bringing your A game, you're not gonna, oh, you're not going to make the edit. You're going to get less screen time. Yeah. And it has this massive um, negative ripple effect. Well, and I think at the end of the day, I take it really seriously the fact that I'm like their lead role. You know, they've hired me because they like my personality and they want me to help carry carry the show. And so if they've chosen me over all these other people and they're relying on me to be an interesting person and then halfway through I'm like oh I'm pretty tired I'm just going to do the bare minimum to get through the day that's not what they're paying for mm, and that's yeah. not what they're relying on you know and it, it's I think you need to bring to the party what they've hired you to do oh that's such a good attitude yeah yeah you've got to take it seriously totally um, and I, I read somewhere this may be true it may not be that you do, you do all your, your own negotiations and contracts yeah. and stuff so do they they fuck you over early on and now the yeah. money's got really good yeah exactly you nailed it yeah what was it <laughs> what, what was it in season one can you say that oh uh, I can't they don't they you can't talk about money because they they don't like it but yeah. um it wasn't great it was kind of like it was like what you might have it was what you would have gotten paid for like a non-filmed season. Right. It's just a normal yachting season. But you wanted to be on TV and so badly, you would have paid them. <laughs> yeah, oh, totally, totally. Yeah. I would have been like, yeah, but yeah. not for anything. Yeah. Um, so the first, and then the second one was slightly better. And then once I kind of managed to establish myself as like a fan favourite and could could kind of be like, look, I know, I know how much you guys want me kind of thing. Now I'm able to negotiate much better. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's all supply and demand, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. How, how badly they want you. Well, so, so there was one thing. Um, so you had a boyfriend on the show for a while, this guy Jack. Yeah. And there was a scene where he... Nice Willie Jack. <laughs> he um, he like um, proposed to you to be his, his, his girlfriend. Yeah. And he had like body paint on him and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. So is that his own idea or is that a Bravo idea? Like the oh, producers, are they like, hey, you should do this? No, as I say, the producers never, ever tell you to do anything. Wow. They do not intervene at all. He actually said to production, he was like, oh, I really want to ask Aisha to be my girlfriend. Do you, like, he was like, do you mind if I do it? And they're obviously like, well, yeah, of course, that's great for story. Like, do what you want. Um, but he, he asked me because he wanted to take me on a date afterwards, just me and him. Because usually, usually it would be the whole group goes out for the dinner, but he wanted just a one-on-one. -on -one. So he asked them, and they, and they were like, yeah, we'll organise a dinner for you. Um, but yeah, that was all, that was his idea. Mm. And it was it's so silly, because I think, it's one of those things where, there's this thing called boat goggles, and <laughs> everyone experiences it at some point. And it's like, you're stuck on a boat, you're in a bubble, there's no one else that's an option. And Jack, when I first came on, I remember... He told me this story about how he was a builder in London living on a houseboat and that if the weather wasn't good, he just couldn't be bothered going so he just wouldn't show up to work and then eventually he got fired. And I remember just listening to that story and being like, oh, that is so unattractive. Like, who just <laughs> who doesn't go to work just because it's cold? Like, yeah. fucking get up and go to work, yeah. you know? Such a poor attitude. Yes, yeah, such a bad And I remember thinking it was so unattractive and I really, like, I thought he was, like, a funny guy but I wasn't attracted to him. But then, sure enough, as the weeks go on and we're, like, there's no one else in sight... He suddenly he somehow got funnier and funnier, and then he got attractive, and you like you start seeing things that you didn't see before, and so we kind of like started this fling, and he asked me about his girlfriend, and I said yes, but then it was almost it was almost like as soon as we wrapped, we were I was like this there's no way like this can work out this isn't going to be a thing, um and so I and I think he thought the same thing, but I didn't have a chance to talk to him about it before he went off to London. And then, so then he was in London and I was trying to f call him to get away to go over there to end it because we were like, because I was like, this is just, we can't like carry this yeah, on. Yeah, it's dumb. Yeah, and, um, and I was trying to get over there. And anyway, long story short, 
he was like, oh, don't come over yet because I've got family and I've got this wedding and it's just like a really difficult time and blah, blah. And then I ended up seeing on his ex-girlfriend's story that she was at the wedding with him. And so I just, I finally managed to get in touch with him and I was like, so you're at this wedding? And I'm like, and he's like, yeah. And I'm like, so Kelly's there? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, so you fucking Kelly? He's like, yeah. I'm like, okay, <laughs> cool. Like, thanks for having a conversation with me before you go and like get back with your ex-girlfriend. So anyway, it, that was all done. It was a shame how it ended because we actually were really, really good friends. And I just felt a little bit betrayed as a friend, but it was never going to yeah, be a last. long-term but thing. And below Dick Land, is he like a villain because of that? Yes. Is he? I uh, know, and that's the thing, because people were so, like, people were so loyal to me that, not like, he's kind of, like, ha- he's just had to kind of keep his head down ever since, because it came out that he, like, you know, essentially cheated on me, and I was supposed to be going to London and all this stuff. And so, yeah, everyone very much had their pitchforks mm. out and trying to stab Jack. It's, it's so funny, eh? Because it's, it is such a big show and there's so many people invested in it. And as I said, I've never seen a full episode, but I've been learning all this stuff. And it's like, oh, I wonder yeah. how, the, what, how the community react to that. And there was another one. Um, who's Chef Ryan? You and oh, Chef Ryan. Oh, Ryan. You, I have not met a more arrogant prick in my life. And I don't say that lightly because I think everyone has got so many beautiful, special things about them. No one is, like, just a prick. But, God, (laughs) he's, like, he's a really hard one to find all the nice things in. Like... (laughs) He was a tough work man. Yeah. Because I saw some episodes on YouTube of um the, the Andy Cohen show, Watch What Happens Live. And yeah. there was one with Ryan talking about you, and then another one of you talking about him. And it was you could just see the disdain. Yeah. Um yeah, mutually, both ways, I think. Oh yeah. It was just it was so hard because that was my first season as Chief Stew. And I was on this boat, this boat that was the size of you should have had four stews, but they only ever do three stews. So it was three of us on a four-person boat, and it was my first full season as a chief stew, and you're being filmed and all of this. And then I had a like a terrible chef who was just a cook, really, like didn't really know how to cook, <laughs> and was an absolute asshole. And so it was a mix of all that. That was the most stressful season I have ever done in my life. I remember I used to wake up at two in the morning every morning, just not like damp from sweat, like actual rivers running down off my body, just so stressed out. I didn't take one break all season. And yeah, so I was already so stressed. And then to top it off, I had this guy who had this absolute attitude and just didn't really know how to cook. And he had this attitude where it's like, no, the guests should listen to me. So on a yacht, the guests, they're paying so much money to be on there. They do whatever the fuck they want, and mm. we dance around it. And you get vague times, but you everyone knows it's never going to be that exact time because if they are in their rooms for longer or if they want to jet ski for longer, it's always going to change and you have to let them. Of course. And so, like, you know, just an example of one time, we I said, like, oh, yeah, the guests are wanting dinner around 8.00. And so it was like, okay, and then it was getting to eight and they were still getting changed and I hadn't said on the radio, I had not said anything about like, because I'd always be like, oh, the guests are making their way to the table, I can see the guests coming up from the cabin, just so you know, like, you know, you kind of communicate that and I hadn't said anything, which means they're nowhere near the table. And I like, so they hadn't even come out of their cabins yet and I run downstairs and the burgers are all just sitting there on their plate. And he's like, well, you said, he just gets this attitude. And he's like, you know, well, you said the um, dinner's at 8 o'clock. So he's like, if, if you can't wrangle the guests and if you can't control your guests and get them to dinner at 8 o'clock, that's your fault. I've done my job. They're here and they're ready. And he refused to, like, recook them. And that was the kind, and that was the kind of attitude I was dealing with all season. And so that's why I ended up saying to him, I'm like, how many yachts have you actually worked on? Because that's not how this works. We don't stick to these times like a stickler. And that's where that whole famous scene blew up, where he's like, well, how many vacuums have you pushed? And I, you know, I was like, <laughs> oh, my God. And there was, so, um, yeah. yeah, well, that's fun. It's, the um, Bravo must love it, though, because it's oh, great. Yeah, it's great yeah. for, you know, you said before it's... um. It's a very organic reality TV, but they st- I guess they still want conflict and drama. Mm. So when things like that happen, they must be frothing about it. Oh, yeah, they love it. And that's why they try and cast 
people who they know will be controversial yeah, or yeah. like bring some sort of personality, you know. But he was just, he was just um, very difficult. And then afterwards, he, because I never react, I knew that all he wanted was like reaction. Mm. So when we left filming, I, I'd never reacted to anything that he had said on his Instagram or anything. And he used to put these stories up where he would Photoshop pictures of me like on the titanic or like spend all this time photoshopping pictures of me into these weird scenes and like just fo- making fun of me and insulting me and i never responded i never responded to them once i only saw them because people would screenshot them and send them to me and then the next season they were asking me about what the chef was like last season so of course i comment on it and then next thing you know he's on his instagram like oh my god she's so obsessed with me you know she just <laughs> keeps talking about me and i'm like says the guy who's like spending all of his time photoshopping <laughs> photos of me yeah. onto the titanic like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Just, you were living rent free in his head yeah but you know i think it's just mm-hmm. par for the course with reality tv you want yeah. to come across these people like a lot of narcissists are attracted to reality tv yeah oh, of course and there was a, a massive story last year um about you intervening and stopping um a likely or yeah. probable or possible sexual assault yeah um yeah what was the go with that So this is during filming. This is during filming. Yeah. And this was quite a huge moment for, I think reality, reality TV in general, because nothing like this has ever been shown before. And you never really see producers intervene either. So that night we'd been out. um, We did drink a lot. Luke was someone who would always like really push the shots and the alcohol and, all of that, and um, we were coming home, and I don't know why exactly, but I just, my spidey senses started tingling, and I was like, something is just off here, like, I don't feel right about something, I didn't really know what, and I was, uh, we were in the vans, and I was in the seat in front of Margot and Luke, and I remember Margot was sitting there, and she was so out of it, she was wasted, like, you know, you know, you know, when, Mm, when the yeah, eyes the are lights on, are on no yeah, what's it saying yeah lights, lights are, are on, on no nobody's home. home yeah so it was like that and i remember luke like kind of prompted her head to go down onto his lap and you know put her down there so that she was lying on his lap and this could be completely wrong but i thought i heard a zip go down and it was just this kind of situation where even even if it didn't even just her head being on his lap i didn't like it because I could see how out of it she was and so as soon as the van stopped I was like I that I just all I saw I had this one track mind I was like I have to get Margot to bed that's all I was thinking and that's all I wanted to do so we got out of the vans and I grabbed Margot and I'm like yeah we're going to bed I'm taking her to bed no one come with us and I march her down and I put her into bed and um and you know some of the guys tried to come in and I was like no you guys need to leave her alone leave Margot she's going to bed now like I don't want anyone else in this cabin and because people had tried to come in I got back into bed with her and I lay they didn't show obviously because they can't do a whole episode of me lying in bed they didn't show how long I was in bed with her for so I was laying in bed with her for like 45 50 minutes kind right. of thing just making sure she was okay just, just, just making sure all the, yeah yeah everything else died 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 away yeah, everyone I went to sleep to, yeah i didn't want anyone else to come in and and i wanted to make sure she fell asleep and she was mm. okay um and then you know but we're so sleep deprived we had so much to do the next day that it got to almost one and i was like oh, i've just got to i've been here for so long i need to get to bed myself so i got got out of bed, went to the crew mess and started making my two, my two minute noodles, which by the way, I'm still waiting for a Maggi t- uh, sponsorship <laughs> because the amount of noodles I bloody ate on the show, I deserve it. Um, so I got out of bed, I did my usual ritual of making my two minute noodles and I was standing at the microwave waiting for them and I just hear this, no, 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 no. And I turn around and there's like two producers and another girl from production sprinting down the stairs and sprinting past me and I'm just like holy shit like what is going on one of the girls actually ran down the stairs so fast she uh, broke her ankle and yeah they're just like no no no. they run past and they're at Margot's door and they're banging on it they're like no no stop 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 and I was like holy fuck and I just was like in shock um and I kind of gauged from their reaction that Luke must have come out of his cabin and gone into her cabin uh and so you know I kind of popped my head around and 
saw what was happening and he was pushing on the door and he actually pushed back on the door so hard that then he broke a producer's toe. It was very hectic. Wow. So I could kind of I kind of figured what was going on. Um and I ended up just going into my cabin and sitting on the floor and crying because I felt like I had I felt like I had failed Margot, you know, because I feel I put so much time and effort into making sure she got to her bed and making sure that nothing happened, that it just, yeah, I just felt like I had failed her. And so I was so upset. And I, yeah, went back to her cabin. What else could you have done, though, apart from just crash out and stay the night with her? Yeah, I, and that's the thing, like, it's not, like, I know looking back on it that it's not like it was my fault and I did, I did so much for her, but I still felt like I failed her in a way. Um, so, yes, yeah, so then I went back in and I made sure she was asleep and then I did stay with her until she was fully asleep. And um, Yeah, and then I went back to my cabin and then I was like, well, I've got to go tell Jason. And so then that's when I went and told Jason. and he Jason's listened. the captain? Yeah, sorry, yeah. I told Captain Jason. And I was really upset, so I was crying when I was talking to him. And, and yeah... He came down and told Luke, Luke to pack his bag straight away and got him off the boat. It was like three in the morning. Um, and, yeah, got him off the boat straight away. And it was just – I think it was really cool that Bravo decided that they wanted to include that and show that. Because, as I say, there's nothing like that has ever been shown mm. on real, reality TV before. And what I think was really good coming from that was – I was so um, I was so warmed by the reaction because the overwhelming reaction was that everyone was so disgusted by it and they're like, oh my, you know, there needs to be consent and, you know, like all of this talk around consent and saying no and that kind of thing. And I was like, wow, the fact that the all of the public is reacting in this way shows me that as a society we're moving in the right direction mm. when it comes to consent and sexual assaults and what we stand for. Absolutely. and I, I, But I feel like this grew, um, even, if, even if you're not a below-deck watcher, this became like bigger than the show itself, right? Oh, Did totally. You, you must have got that feeling at the time. It was, um, yeah. it was everywhere, this story. Oh, abs- it was absolutely everywhere. And I think what I found the hardest... Uh, like I was so warmed by that, and I and I loved the reaction. I lo- and I think it got everyone talking about really important messages. Um, but I think the hard part was that I never wanted anyone to think that I was like capitalizing off a really horrible situation, you know, because I had so many magazines and different places call it, like, trying to get articles out of me and stuff. And I actually said no to pretty much all of them because I didn't want to gain any sort of following. Or, yeah, yeah, from yeah. from something that you should just do anyway and from someone else's misfortune because mm. it actually really fucked with Margot's head, like, because um, we told her about it the next day and it was actually something that she really has struggled with and she got when she started getting therapy afterwards and really had to work through it because she's such a beautiful innocent like girl next door kind of girl and um yeah and she just really struggled with it so I didn't want to play on anyone's misfortune and get some sort of gain for myself you know well I I didn't come across any negativity around that but I'm sure there there has been over the years because if you put yourself out there for a show like Below Deck you're going to get it how how have you coped over the years adjusting to being in the public eye and the trolling and the mean comments and stuff. Have, have you been subjected to much of that? Oh, a little bit. But I'm I'm really lucky that I would say 98% of my feedback is really positive, mm. which I'm so lucky about. <laughs> I honestly attribute so much of my success to my Kiwi accent because anything that you say with a Kiwi accent, Americans are like, wow, you're so funny, you're so <laughs> cute. You know, it's such a novelty to them. But... um. The, the negative comments that I always get are, God, she sounds so whiny. Because, yeah, because I'm always like, oh, my God. Because every time I'm excited, I'm like, oh, that's so cool. And, you know, people say that I'm whiny. And the biggest one is just that my voice is really annoying. But comments like that, I'm like, I can't change my voice. I don't give a shit, you know. And every time people, most of the time that people see me in public, they're like, I always hear your voice and then I follow the voice. And so I'm like, having a unique voice is a good thing because 
that's what's going to make me stand out. This another thing to make you stand out from yeah. other people. Yeah. So, I don't know. The negative comments that I do get just really don't bother me. Mm. You know, and I, I think for me, I've got. I've I don't have I've got a good self esteem like I'm not insecure and I've got enough people around me that love me unconditionally that I don't really care if Barbara in Kansas thinks my voice annoying <laughs> you know like yeah. it's done pretty well for me Good. so far yeah a hundred percent and you, yeah you, you've got such a good attitude which I'm guess and I'm guessing part of that comes from um, the way you were raised and your yeah. dad and the way that he he communicated with you guys yeah but also you, you know some could say you're at the high risk of um, like being an alcoholic yourself or having yeah. mental health issues yourself. Yeah. And it seems like, yeah, from the chat we've had the last hour 20, there's, you know, there's none of that with you. No, which I'm really lucky for. Like my, as I say, I think, I think in a lot of ways, my siblings are like, why did you just get away with all this stuff? Because <laughs> they have really struggled with addiction, yeah. um, not alcohol, but other things. And, um, depression and, and anxiety and I don't have an I don't have an addictive personality at all um and my brain chemistry is fortunately very in my favor um I guess the only things that I get from mum is I'm very OCD like I was talking to you about this before the show I can get a bit obsessive with things but nothing that's like any sort of huge detriment to my life yeah, so yeah. I just um I've just managed to navigate this whole path uh, in a way that's really benefited me somehow. <laughs> well, it seems like just by being your true and authentic self, it's working bloody well for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Oh, let's talk about Scott for a bit. So, yes. so Scott Dobson, your partner. Yeah. yeah. Um, hopefully, getting engaged in the next year. Yes, I would hope so. <laughs> yes, Scott. Uh, Scott. Um, so you guys, you, you guys went to school together. He's yeah. from Todonga as well, like yeah. primary school, intermediate, um, secondary? high school. Yeah. So, so where were you? Did you go to the ball together or anything? No, or? I was actually at his 18th, didn't even realise it was his party and was on his driveway crying about some other guy that had just cheated on me. <laughs> so <laughs> we, um, yeah, so we went to high school together, but he was in my brother's year, so he was the year above me. And it was one of those situations where I didn't care about guys from, because I went to Bethlehem, I didn't care about guys from Bethlehem, that was boring. I was always hanging out with guys from like Tauranga Boys or Otomodai. Um, and then also because my brother was in the year above, it was one of those things where no one was allowed to touch Jared's younger sister. So none of the guys were really interested in me anyway. Um, so yeah, just acquaintances. We'd say hi when we walked past each other, that kind of thing. And then fast forward about 10 years, his mum is American. So he got a scholarship for soccer at an American college. So he went to uni over there. Um, went on a motorbike trip one day through Breckenridge, loved it, never left. So he was in Breckenridge, which is in Colorado. And then I started going back and forth to LA a lot for Below Deck and interviews and stuff like that. And he was always really good at catching up with anyone that came over to the West Coast side um, to catch up, because not that many Kiwis do. So he saw that I was one day, messaged me. Um, sorry if you didn't actually want this, want the whole story, by the way. <laughs> no, 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 I do. It's great. Um, so messaged me and then, um, and I was actually sitting at the gate about to fly off to do season five filming and then flying home. So the timing was really bad. I was like, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm doing all this stuff and I was really busy. Um, and I and at the time, but I did find him really interesting. And at the time, I wasn't interested in him in that way. He was just like a cool guy from home. So I would take like a week to reply to him, kind of thing. This was in October, and then by Christmas, we were messaging like every single day and like waiting for each other's messages. Because over time, I just found him more and more interesting, and then eventually developed a crush and realized he did all these cool things that, ha which was how I wanted my life to look and so adventurous and exciting. Uh, and then it got to Jan end of January, and we were like really messaging every day and like flirting and all this thing. And so I was like, I've just got to take my chance. And so I said, look, why don't I just come over and see you for a couple of weeks? Let's like do it. I'll come over for a holiday. And he was like, yes, yes, come <laughs> over. And he was living in his converted ambulance at the time. So we started talking in October. By the end of, at the end of February, I flew over to Colorado and we did a two-week road trip in his 
ambulance and it was so cute when I landed uh, I was walking out of arrivals and he was standing like all this hot like this hot like mountain cowboy guy leaning against his truck and I ran towards him and we had our first kiss at the airport and we did this two week road trip and it was just magic it so, was you, so you just cool. sort of knew straight away at the airport because of all the communication you'd had leading up to yeah, yeah yeah totally knew but we were still like because we're still both very logical kind of people at the end of that trip we were like well let's not put a label on it yet like mm. we've been in this false environment um of course we're going to be so into each other when we're like kayaking through canyons and stuff because it was like this extreme sports kind of two weeks. It was oh, yeah, it's like an Instagram highlights real yeah, relationship. Toad, yeah, exactly. And we're like, of course, we're going to be so into each other. Let's just like wait a bit. So I flew back to New Zealand and I flew back to New Zealand because I was meant to be doing Dancing with the Stars. And five days later, all the lockdowns happened and I was stuck at home. So we would just had this magical two weeks and then I was stuck in the house for we didn't know how long at that time mm. and we even said we were like well do he was like do we just not like do this because we've got no idea how long you're going to be stuck in New Zealand blah blah and I remember sitting on the bed and I was like I'm not gonna let COVID be the reason that we don't see what we could be <laughs> <laughs> you know? and he's like yep no okay I agree um, and so yeah seven weeks we just FaceTimed and seven weeks later as soon as we went from level four to level three I went back over there and yeah and then it was all on and here we are it's been almost four years now amazing and you're looking at buying a house yeah, yeah. and it's, I think it was really special for me because we we only moved back about a month ago um, and until then I was primarily based in the states but I'm someone who's just like I froth New Zealand so hard mm. I think it's just the best country the best culture the best everything so being in the states and having someone there where it's like oh remember this teacher you know this road you know this suburb oh pies or oh, four square like having someone that you could like talk about <laughs> New Zealand yeah, like you've yeah, got yeah. that connection yeah was really, really special for me. Yeah, that's cool. So we're together basically because of the four square. <laughs> that's wonderful. But yeah, no, it was really nice. And, and his parents live mm. in Tauranga, so it's just all been really yeah. nice. God, you're so family orientated. Oh, yeah, yeah. my family's my everything. Mm. I love them. Well, that's been an hour 26. Hey, Nico, how are we going for time with the hard drive? Yeah, okay. All right, well, should we, um, oh, oh, we didn't even get to, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. Oh, you're, yeah. You did the Australian um, show, you finished the like only thing, sorry, oh, just you, so How much know, time have you got? I do have a meeting at one, so I've only really got like 10 more minutes. Okay, sorry. okay. Oh, no, that's cool. You, you, you did say an hour and a half, and we're almost at an hour yeah. and a half now. Um, yes, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, you finished third. Yes. Yeah, what, yeah. Was, what was Honey Badger like? Oh, he was, yeah, he was great. He was, he was one of those guys, he came in and he was like, he kind of became Camp Daddy straight away because he is just like a man of the earth. Like, he comes in with his big whip and he he just knows how to whip so hard. <laughs> and he, it's almost like he will look at a fire and it just goes, yes, Nick, yes, Nick. Boof, and this fire just appears out of nowhere and, like, birds come and die in his hands and he'll eat the bird. And, I mean, not really, but he's just like, he's yeah, yeah, like, like the survival guru like mm. he's such a guy he's such a lad you know well, he did that he said his show and i think he finished like yeah. top three or top oh, two in that incredible yeah. yeah so that was really cool he was i must say he was pretty hard to get to know because he came in two weeks late because he was like the wild card and then i think it kind of felt like he didn't really want to be there so we had all been in camp and we had these really strong bonds um and then he came in and he was lovely but you could kind of you kind of got the feeling he didn't really want to establish. Yeah. He didn't really care about establishing. <laughs> Not here to make friends. Friendships, yeah. So I did find him quite hard to get to know. Yeah. But, you know, that's cool. We're all on our own path. He had a new baby at home. He probably just wanted to be back with the baby but wanted some money. So, yeah, for sure. I, like, no one took it personally, but he was probably the one that I got to know the least. Mm. Yeah. I feel like you'd, you, you would have an ability to get to know just about anybody. Well, and that's You're the thing. Disarming. That's why I found it so bizarre because I was like, I was actually trying. I was like, I'm going to get him. I'm going to get him. <laughs> and he just like didn't give anyone anything really. So I was like, oh, okay, you know. Yeah. yeah. And so what's your future going to look like? Because you still want to do more TV. Yeah. Do you want to get into hosting or is yeah. it just. But I feel like your strength is definitely things that um, highlight your personality. Yeah. So I really want to.
to continue with TV. I want to do Below Deck for another few years just because since it is a, go- a global show, you know, it's all over the world, it's, there's no way with any, not many other shows could offer me the ability to raise my profile that much, you know, like, um, so it is, it's a really great, show to be in when you're trying to grow your name and then after a couple of se- after a couple more seasons I really want to shift into hosting like I really want to host like Love Island or The Amazing Race like Sophie Monk is someone who I really look up to I think she's so cool mm-hmm. and I basically want to do what she's doing you know I want to yeah. shift into that host but somewhere where it's like not hosting where I have to follow a script like I want to do hosting where where I can just be me. Because as you say... That's your strength. Yeah, I, that's my strength. I'm great at being me. If you get me to... Like, I'm the worst actress ever. I was an extra in Shortland Street a couple of times, and it was horrific. I cannot <laughs> act to save myself. Yeah. So I just need to do things where I can just... I just need to do things where I can just be myself. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I love how open you are about what you want to do. I feel like that's sort of manifesting in the way and yeah. opening doors. Yeah. Um, all right, okay, we'll end with a few random bits off the internet. So okay. I heard um, Slice of Heaven, you want that to be your funeral song. Yes! <laughs> That's I, random. Yes. That is so random. Every time it comes on, I like look at Scott and he's like, yes, honey, I know you want it as your funeral song. You don't have to tell me every time. <laughs> it's on a, it's, So when we're in the jungle, um, near the end of it, we all got to pick a song to play because um, you can't listen to any music or anything in there. And that was my song that I got to play, and it was so, we're all in the camp, like, da 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 um, da 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 just like starving and <laughs> gone, all these bones crashing together, but so happy, yeah. you know. Gee, I never thought about that as a funeral song, but there's the, that line in there, howdy angels, yeah. where'd you find your wings? I yeah. think there'd be not a dry eye in the house. Exactly! Funeral, yeah. Because I want my funeral to be, it's a fun, like a fun celebration, and I think it's a good mixture of like fun, but God, you better cry your eyes out. Mm. You know, you, there's no way you could not cry with that line. Yeah, um, <laughs> oh, you're you're a vegan, but you you do eat saveloys, miniature saveloys. I love saveloys <laughs> Cheerios. Cheers. So, I, on everyone, all of my friends know every single pot like I go to, I show up with a bowl of those. I love processed meat, like the faker the better. I just love it. Um, but no, I was I was a vegetarian for like eight years. Uh, cause I was living with a friend of mine that was vegetarian. And so I was like, I'll do it with you. Totally lost my taste for meat. Um, and just love being vegetarian. We didn't really eat meat growing up anyway. So I was quite used to that. Um, cause dad's, dad's vegetarian primarily. And then it was just, and then I, when it was like a year ago, I said to my friend, I was like, oh, should we try being vegan? And so then I did that and I really enjoyed that. But I just always, I've always struggled with anemia and being really low in iron. And it was actually after the jungle. I'd been in the jungle and I came out and I was in South Africa. And I ordered this steak. And I took one bite of it and it was like my whole world just shook beneath me. It was the nicest thing I'd ever (laughs) had in my mouth, ever. I loved it so much. So now I like, I'm a, I'm a frother for the steak, but, um, I just don't like when you see that the farms here aren't too bad. When you see the farms in the States, even Scott like gets watery eyes they're so fucked so I um Scott's dad does home kill so I eat meat now at home because he does home kill and I feel really I feel fine about that or like hunted meat um so yeah so now I eat meat as long as it's from like an ethical source (laughs) I like that yeah I like that plus Cheerios which aren't from an ethical source (laughs) I don't know what they are it's mystery meat oh but I love a little red (laughs) sausage it's so good um the finger up the bum at eight story that's gonna have to wait wait till next time oh yeah yeah exactly well now I know how poo comes out part yep the, yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. This, I mean but again a, like I mean, a lot of kids probably experiment but and they might remember it as an adult but they're not going to talk about it yeah and also they missed out the part where I tasted it afterwards oh too. my god yeah oh and it god. tasted like it tasted like poo smells <laughs> yeah <laughs> All right, Aisha Scott, you're an absolute gem. Oh, by, by the way, 800,000-odd Instagram followers. How many of them are New Zealanders? 
Oh, 2%? Come 2%. on, New Zealand. Wow. We do have a very small population, though. Mm. Yeah. But, but around, around Tauranga, if you're at a cafe, or you, you, just before, the day before we recorded this, you were at Juicy Fest. Yeah. Do you get spotted a lot out and a yeah. lot of selfies? Or? Yeah, so actually it was really nice yesterday at Juicy Fest. There were quite a few people that came, that come up and are like hyperventilating and shaking. And they're just like, we, we all watch Below Deck all the time. And they just... The thing I love about Kiwis is, like, Americans come up to you and they freak out and, and you know, ask for photos or whatever. But Kiwis, they kind of, they, they wait until it's a good time for you and they come over and they're so polite. And then they're always like, well, you know, we just think that you're this and you're this and you represent New Zealand so well. And that's the one that means the most to me. Like, that's the one that really, like, plucks at my heartstrings. Mm. And they just say such beautiful, kind compliments. And then they're like, would you mind if we got a photo? Would that be too much to ask? And then they're like... Thank you so much for your time. And we're just so polite here. I really, really love it. Mm. And it's nice because, yeah, again, I just love New Zealand so much that it's and when Kiwis come up and do that, that really means a lot to me. Oh, that's so cool. You yeah. are a great ambassador. Thank you. Um, and just a great person. And um, I can't wait to see what the future brings. I feel like Below Deck's just the beginning of it. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. I have a feeling... <laughs> I've got a feeling Okay Hey well best of luck Thank you so much For making the time To come on the podcast today Thank and, you And uh, we'll see you soon Awesome Cheers